Cloud, Australia's nomadic novelist, although not too nomadic at the moment because, like you, I am in lockdown, um, seeing what happens next. We are enduring a situation that is stranger than fiction right now, stripped of our right to choose how we live. Um, we're told, obviously, the lockdown is for our own good. And the words for our own good is actually the perfect segue for my talk today because I'm going to be talking about uh, my sixth novel, uh, Contemporary Australian Fiction, this one called House of Wishes. Now, in 2020, we are forced to do as we're told. You know, it's not the first time that Australians have been stripped of their right to choose. In the 50s, 60s and 70s, young unmarried women who fell pregnant were regarded by their families as an embarrassment, as stains on society, and they were sent away to have their babies and to give them up. They were told, it's for your own good, but they were lied to, tricked by the people they trusted and ostracized by family and the community. Unlike us today, there was no Google 24 seven, no information, no transparency, no support. Their babies were treated as commodities and the mothers collateral damage of a system. I researched this topic um, because House of Wishes is very much about this period in time when mothers were tricked into leaving their homes. They were put into maternity houses, run a lot, a lot of the time by, by churches and do-gooders. When it time came to have their babies, their faces were covered, their babies were removed. They were actually then segregated from the real mothers um, and told things like um, the milk suppressing drugs that they were being given. They were told that they were medications for, for killing pain. And they were told it's all for their own good. So I delve into this painful period in our history for House of Wishes. It's a story that centres on three women and a secret pact made between two teenage girls 40 years earlier. It's a moving exploration of the loss of innocence, grief, belonging and redemption. I have a few quotes here today from a book reviewer, Claudine Tanellis, who has a podcast called Talking Aussie Books Podcast. And if you don't know it and you love listening to book podcasts, I suggest you check it out. Claudine says, as a book that cannot, it's a book that cannot fail to move readers with its no holds barred commentary on the once cruel treatment of unmarried mothers by their own families, the church and the community at large. Linked to the historical stigma of unwed mothers and woven throughout House of Wishes are other story threads involving sexual abuse, suicide, addiction and bullying. I know they all sound like pretty heavy issues, but rest assured, as with all Jen J. McLeod books, there are moments where you will have a smile and a laugh. Um, it's a balanced story um, of, of one part of our, our history. The story begins with a mother's wish to have her ashes scattered in a small town cemetery, which leads a grieving daughter to understand life is about the choices we make, the connections that matter, the secrets we keep, and the power of a wish. Now I do read the first chapter um, of this book and I'll, I'll tell you where to find that at the end of today's talk. Um, House of Wish Wishes moves between two timelines set 40 years apart. The narrative shifts between Beth's journey to understand her late mother's wish and a fellow called Don Dawson. He's a farmer slash stonemason slash handyman um, as, as people were um, 40 years ago on the land, doing anything they can um, to make ends meet. But he has a connection to Dandelion House. Now, Dandelion House, if it sounds familiar to any of my listeners out there right now, um, my first book, House for All Seasons, is set at Dandelion House. Um, it, the setting is around 20... Uh, not, uh, 
2012. Um, and so it's a different time setting to 1974, which we cover off in House of Wishes. So we're just going back to a common setting, Dandelion House in the town of Calangary Crossing. So in 1974, in House of Wishes, two girls, strangers, meet at Dandelion House. Both girls are not yet 18, both are unmarried, both are about to give birth for the first time. They're opposites in looks, personality and upbringing. And Lizzie and Irene obviously see life very differently. For that reason, I guess they were very challenging characters for me to develop. Um, and for more reasons than, than that, um, they were 18 and pregnant. Now, it's been a long time since I was 18, although I did enjoy going back to 1974 when I was 14 uh, and not pregnant. But um, I really did enjoy um, getting into the, the, the minds of these two, two young girls, one a lot more mature um, than the other. And as I say, their reasons for being there um, of how they managed to find their way to Dandelion House, very different stories. In fact, House of Wishes is probably the most challenging novel I have written to date. I think I said it was my sixth novel and people are saying it's my best. Um, the reviews are, have been so great and that's really um, comforting uh, knowing that it was a very challenging story, a big story really, to put into about 340 pages, so 120,000 words. Very hard for me because I'm very verbose when it comes to my storytelling. Um, but this story also is not just one character's journey. There are multiple male and female points of view that bring different aspects of the story to life, both the current day thread in 2014 and back in 1974. The other character challenge Probably the biggest character challenge was Don Dawson. One, he's male, and a male point of view is always a challenge uh, for a female author. Um, also, Don is not your quintessential country guy. Now, anyone who knows my books knows that I'm not really into, I don't create sort of stereotypes, I don't have your cliched sort of characters. I like things to be a bit different. In House of Wishes, for example, I have one of my lead male characters in a wheelchair. Um, you know, unbelievably, back then I was questioned um, by an editor in relation to having a character like that. Thank goodness times have changed. Um, but I, you know, it's, um, it, it, it's a challenge to me to write to people who are authentic and a little bit different. The other thing with Don is he ages, so the two th story threads are 40 years apart. Um, so we meet Don when he's 23 and then we meet him again at 63 uh, after he's had a lifetime of troubles, which I'm responsible for. Um, initially, um, Don's character was meant to be nothing more than like a conduit to the past for Beth, who was the current day character, the daughter looking for some answers. So he was supposed to be sort of just um, somebody that Beth could talk to who might shed some light uh, for her and also um, link her to the other female points of view. But as it turned out, uh, once I got stuck into Don's backstory and started developing this guy and all his um, various um, interesting traits that I gave him, what ended up was the, the women, the, the, the women point of views, ended up being support characters almost to Don's very emotional story. And it's Don's story that I get most of the emails uh, from um, readers about. So Don still makes me cry when I read certain parts of uh, House of Wishes. Um, Claudine Tanellis, um says of Don, um, Don was a particularly real character for me. We saw the girls from his eyes and I found the aspect fascinating and a heartwarming point of view to read. So speaking of character inspiration uh, and women's fiction, which really is about the character's emotional journey, 
My Behind the Books cover tour talks about the insights into character inspiration processes and I have slides and, and things to show you. So I brought one of those slides along with me today just to show you a little bit about how an author might find inspiration. Now, my way of finding inspiration for my characters always with my books is somebody um, that I know, either in real life or maybe from the movies. Um, of course, every author, well, I think every author, I certainly do, every time I write a book, I imagine that book up on the big screen. So who would I like to play my characters? Well, I've got here Beth and Don and Tom. Now, I'll talk about each of them separately. Um, Beth is, of course, uh, oh, she's a dancer. She's a musical theatre performer. So she's tall and she's graceful in her way she walks, quite elegant but quite independent and, um, and really quite lovely. And I just love Jennifer Connolly um, for all that she brings to the screen. Um, now Don, Don's my interesting character because Don um, is a little bit different. You'll read the book and you'll see the sort of traits that I've given him. But, you know, for example, when he's 23 years of age in the beginning of the book, he has a very big receding hairline already. He's tall, he's gangly, he's awkward with his feet, he's awkward when he talks to girls. He's teased a lot when, um, with girls in the, the small country town of Calangary Crossing where he lives. So um, what he loves about the girls at Dandelion House that he meets is that they don't judge him because they don't want to be judged, obviously. So there's a, a mutual respect there between them. Um, I didn't want Don to be really good looking. And even though Adrian Brody scrubs up really beautifully, I think he was just a really great example of what I wanted Don to, to look like. Some beautiful characteristics, but not necessarily the most attractive guy. Sorry if you're listening. Um, and then, of course, Tom. Now, there is a love interest in the book for Beth. And um, Tom is, is a gorgeous country guy and I can't think of a better person to play him on the big screen than Simon Baker. In fact, I think you'll probably find Simon Baker in every single one of my books because I just think he's, he's lovely. So there you go. So character authenticity is important. But authenticity also means getting the facts right in the fiction. And there are strong historical links in the House of Wishes. 20 years ago, the New South Wales Parliament held an inquiry into adoption practices. And the result of that was the 2012 formal apology for the terrible suffering and trauma experienced by mothers and fathers and children of forced adoptions. It was through this inquiry, the results, the transcripts, that I was able to research some of the real stories that women told years, lifetimes of suffering. Um, it was absolutely heartbreaking. I read the most terrible stories about how these girls were lied to and tricked and banished from their homes. I remember one really stands out where the girl was told they were going to all go away as a family and they all packed their bags and got in the car. And they drove to a place, she got out with her bag the family all got back in the car, closed the doors and drove off and left her there. Um, these girls were just um, abandoned and stripped of their right to choose, not only uh, with their family, but once they actually got to the maternity homes, there was a lot of deceit and trickery and ill treatment. I got a good grasp of the emotional turmoil as much as you can by reading a transcript that affected these mothers and the fathers and the children who I also read terrible stories about when they um, eventually found out that they were late adoptees, um, late in, uh, adoptees late in life. While House of Wishes is about the choices we make or the choices that are made for us in various aspects of life, all the characters in House of Wishes deal with having to make choices. Um, there is one character called Cheryl. Now Cheryl actually features in, or not features, she's a secondary character in um, House for All Seasons. She's one of the reasons I actually wanted to write this third Calangary Crossing novel um, because I wanted to know who Cheryl was before um, 
2012 when I wrote House for All Seasons. So Cheryl's husband and father, we find out, like to make choices for her. They treat her very badly. Um, Tom, the love interest in the story, has to choose between the truth and the lie when he realises that the truth will hurt more than it heals. We find out about Don as a young man and how Don's father likes to make the choices for him very much um, um, the country way when it comes to inheritance. Um, Don is not the eldest son, but he is the more passionate about the land. But, of course, the father makes his own choice in that regard. And then, of course, uh, there's young Irene and Lizzie back in 1974 who struggle with the choices being made for them. Uh, through Don's story, uh, we also... Uh, there's another thread where we learn about the despair of drought-stricken farmers and their families. And of this, Claudine says, I tasted the dust that coated the windows and seeped into the cupboards and found its way between the bedsheets. I saw the cemetery filled with gravestones of those who succumbed to the black dog. With all its heavier issues people do ask why I wrote House of Wishes and what I hope readers will take away. Why I wrote it I think I mentioned so there was House for All Seasons and ever since 2013 when that was released it was number five top selling debut novel that year I've had a lot of emails come still to this day regarding Gypsy and the Dandelion House. So the Dandelion House is an unusual place. It's um, a homestead that was built on an island in the middle of a large river, um, which I sort of based, if you're familiar with New South Wales, I based it on the McLean sort of Clarence River area. Um, and also the owner of Dandelion House, Gypsy, who plays a significant role in a house for all seasons, but has no point of view. So we never really get to find out what Gypsy's, <coughs> Gypsy is, <coughs> Gypsy's past. Excuse me, I'm <laughs> talking too much. Mm. So we find out about Gypsy and we find out about the Dandelion House. But there were also some secondary characters, so I mentioned Cheryl before, who wouldn't leave my head. They, they were in my head knocking away saying tell my story tell my story so that was another reason why I wanted to do a third Calangari Crossing novel now the three novels House for All Seasons, Simmering Season and House of Wishes are all standalone they just simply share the setting of Calangari Crossing and Dandelion House if there's anything I want readers to take away I guess the thing I hope they'll take from this story is how far we've come as a country in terms of women's right to choose, but how easily the work done by generations of women in the past could just slip away if we don't keep speaking up about a woman's right to choose. I also hope that people take um, strength from life's curveballs, um, but also keep believing in the power of wishes and to look for silver linings. Lastly, I think an understanding that family is about connection rather than blood. And let's face it, connection, as we now know, is such a powerful um, and comforting thing. I think we also need to cherish our freedom to choose because as we're experiencing, it can so easily be taken away. I mean, who would ever have thought that a woman's right to choose would again be the topic of discussion? And yet... I see overseas in a news report, that's exactly what's happening. Then again, no one would have thought we'd all be sitting in our homes, our freedom to live our lives restricted by laws and orders, you sitting there, me sitting here, unable to get together in a, a library um, and chat about, about books. Um, <clears throat> my books are fiction um, and I don't attempt to right wrongs and I, I don't try to change the world in, you know, by writing my stories. But if they can make people think and maybe influence their choices, then, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. 
I, we're taught as authors to not teach or preach to our readers, but what I choose to do is use motives throughout my stories. Um, and the right motive can actually um, be a lesson in many ways and encourage people to think about the impact of their choices on others. So I would say make wise choices, particularly over the next six months. I think use the time at home to read, particularly to review, get onto some of those review sites and leave a review for the author and also recommend, but also take time to reflect. As my characters say in House of Wishes, make sure the life you choose is the one you want. Make a decision to leave nothing undone and never settle for less when there's more. Speaking of motives, in addition to the dandelion flower that features uh, in House of Wishes and also in House for All Seasons at the Dandelion House, my characters are, are very much looking for silver linings and I think we all need to. Now is a really great time to lose yourself in a fictional story. Go ahead and buy or borrow. It doesn't matter how you get your books, although I will at this point in time um, just give a little warning about piracy sites. Some of them are awfully good and I've met readers who don't even realise they are pirate sites. They simply tell me they found these sites that have all their favourite authors with books to download for free. Let me just give you a word of warning about viruses, okay? We're living with COVID-19. You do not want a virus on your computer as well. And that's what these piracy sites will deliver, as well as delivering you a free book. They will deliver cookies and viruses to your computer. So be very careful of that. I can guarantee that um, all those favourite authors of yours, whilst they may have free promotional books from time to time, they'll be on on proper ebook sites. So any website that's claiming um, to have free books, uh, please check it out because it's probably a pirate it's a piracy site. Really, the best book um, that's free. The best free books are those borrowed from the library. If you are lucky enough to have a local bookstore and they are delivering in this time, please support them. I know my local book warehouse is now online and delivering. Or you can support the author by going direct to the website. House of Wishes is available in ebooks, audio, and in print. And Wild Myrtle Press is delivering signed copies via Australia Post. So please keep supporting libraries. Librarians will be missing you as much as you are missing them. I certainly hope to recommence my Behind the Book Cover Tour when we can, and I hope to meet you all face to face in the future. But because so many authors have had events cancelled like me, what I've done is I've um, created a public group on Facebook. For those of you on Facebook, it's called Boredom Busting Books. Please look it up. What I'm doing is helping to keep authors and readers connected. And that is where you'll find uh, me reading my first chapter of House of Wishes. And you'll find a whole lot of other authors reading their first chapters as well. I thought before I go now, I would read the back cover blurb. So I'll just get that. So you might not be allowed to leave your home, but you can still come to Callangarry Crossing and stay a while in Dandelion House. So here we go. Here's the blurb. Dandelion House, 1974. Two teenage girls, strangers, make a pact to keep a secret. Callangarry Crossing, 2014. For 40 years, Beth and her mum have been everything to each other. But Beth is blindsided when her mother dies and her last wish is to have her ashes spread in a small town cemetery. On the outskirts of Callangarry Crossing, when Beth comes across a place called Dandelion House Retreat, her first thought is how appealing the name sounds. With her stage career waning and struggling to see a future without her mum, her marriage and her child, she hopes it's a place where she can begin to heal. After meeting Tom, a local cattleman, Beth is intrigued by his stories of the cursed century-old river house and its reclusive owner, Gypsy. The more Beth learns, however, the more she questions her mother's wishes. 
When meeting Beth leads Tom to uncover a disturbing connection to the old house, he must decide if the truth will help a grieving daughter or hurt her more. Should Dandelion House keep its last long-held secret? Thank you for listening and I hope to see you in real life one day soon.